Oh gosh, I'm upside down. Oh. Your face. <laughs> Great. Let me see if I can just uh, change my phone position. Yes. Oh, is it that? Like that? Oh. Still sideways. I'm sideways. Which way is your phone? Is it? Oh. This is the best start to a YouTube live ever, right? I know. I know. I can. I tell you what. I can. I can change my orientation. I can do that. Let's do this. Okay. Sorry, everybody, for this technical. I can try. <laughs> okay, almost there. Okay, let me try that. One of the there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can I can hear you. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, thank you so much for um for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for asking me to be a part. Yeah, it feels like a real privilege to, to get to connect and just ask you some questions and dig into what is an amazing album. And actually it's been so nice as I've been like preparing for this interview just to get an opportunity to actually really like listen to the album properly again and just really kind of immerse myself in the songs. So it's been oh. a, it's been a real gift. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and I'm sorry it took so long. It's been a busy season. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe maybe start there. Like, what what is life looking like at the moment? Well, at the moment, I um, I'm working on a new album. So it's been all last week in the studio. In a way, That's I have in a long time. So. Um, it's been several years since I did a studio session with like a full band. Yeah. And I was kind of missing. Um, I have a, one of my big, my big is physically be with more people, mm. um, which I, I'm a very extroverted person. And so the longest time I thought my major problems is I too much, you know, I'm like the last you know, stay up too late. Oh, and uh, it's hard to get up in the mornings. Yeah. You know, I'm, I like to be with people. I've been reading about um, uh, how loneliness is bad. Yeah. Will help, right? Like, they're calling it the new loneliness is like cigarettes, right? Yeah. People are spending a lot of time alone, and they're and it's because they're not. Having interactions with other people had for centuries, right? Yeah. And, um, we create and, and human presence, and one of my big goals is to be with, people, which is that's what I've always wanted anyway. So I'm spending yeah. more time with people that's because amazing. it's healthy. Yeah. But, but also, I want the, this new album. I wanted to do it. The, which was in a studio with the whole band at one time. And it, it doesn't mean we're not doing dubs or editing or ripping apart and putting them back together, but I can being with phenomenal musicians and creative people. And so uh, I forgot how that was, but yeah. um, we rented a studio. It's, it's a studio I've always wanted to um work in up in Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah. Bands like the War on and uh the Avit Brothers and Amazing. Really, really huge records were made. I rented it out for a uh with a bunch of my favorite musicians and we so nerve wracking because I also it's been a long time since I finished songs before I started recording them. Yeah. Weeks leading up to it, it's like I have this insanely expensive um, time that I've booked. 
studio and you know there be there so i needed to finish the song so i was working night and day to then once we were there i was sort of like just in it and it's uh when yeah. it be in it those last weeks really really busy but yeah yeah oh good for you well we can't wait can't wait to hear what that comes out like and it's just yeah such a gift to have these moments where everything converges you know being in a inspiring space like that studio and bringing all your favorite musicians together just such a joy it is a joy and you forget how they play off of one another yeah and they want to impress one another, but also affect one another and then they're yeah. inspired really cool yeah i love that um i'm getting a tiny bit of um cutting out on your end i don't know if it is your end but are you hearing me or clearly because i just want to make sure we don't miss anything i do okay okay maybe maybe it's just a mic thing um i want to hear all about the production on deep magic but maybe I, we can get to that later but maybe sure. can we just start with like, where did this album start in your heart? Like, what was what was the process where you that led you to be like, I'm making an album, and it's around this this theme. Um, like, what was the kind of origin story sure. of this album? So the album started for me way back during the pandemic. Um, I was uh, it was it was the summer of the pandemic. I want. 2020 it was like the worst part of the pandemic and yeah. i was stuck at home all of my plans had deleted and i had i'd sort of decided to um, spend my time uh doing stuff on the internet filming videos and things like that. yeah uh and then that's the summer uh the, the george floyd thing happened and the and uh and our internet exploded and there was especially in my stream so there's there's so much anger mm. um and hostility it was it was almost impossible to be online right yeah. and so being online was the only thing i had to do and now i can't be online anymore I couldn't make videos it felt wrong it felt like at the time, if you weren't talking about the issue, number one, no one either wanted to listen, or number two, you felt like you were being irresponsible. But yeah. also, I'm a social genius. You know, like I, I want to live, I wanted to listen, I wanted to be part of whatever was happening, but it was really hard. And I didn't mm -hmm. do, I didn't know who I was. So I just got off the internet yeah. and found myself with even less to do than before. Yeah. So, I filled my time writing songs mm. and that's when I started writing deep magic. Um, and really it was just cause I didn't know what to do with myself. So the first song that I wrote for deep magic was deliver me. Mm. And that was really about, would you deliver me from the deliver us from like the social issues, the injustice that plagues us, but would you also deliver us from the anger and the, hate and the resentment and the ugliness mm. Online would deliver me from my boredom mm. and deliver me my anxiety. And would you deliver me, you know, from my uh, my feeling stuck? Yeah. You know, I, was, I feel like I was losing myself. Would yeah. you deliver? So it was like this deliver me was sort of a social statement. Would you deliver us mm. from hate and racism and injustice and violence? But also to deliver me from my feeling of lostness and yeah, from my stuckness. Would you? And then would you live the pandemic so that we could go out in the world and and be right? Yeah, and all of the all of those things. That's really when I started writing. Uh, yeah, the album. so good. Um, throughout our conversation, I wanted to bring in some of your lyrics because sure. honestly i had to like read and reread some of them because i was like this is so good <laughs> like your 
your grasp of, of like metaphor and unexpected imagery is just honestly it's it's so masterful so I just I loved again just being a bit of a geek about your album today but um this this statement the, the footsteps of the midwife are already in motion just so beautiful like kind of in in the lostness because I guess there's like a sense of hope in that statement mm. in that you know the midwife is coming and like god god will deliver us there is there is hope as much as there is sort of wrestle and doubt in this album and I guess I don't know just sort of for yourself personally as you were writing these songs were you feeling hope or was it sort of was it almost like you're willing yourself towards hope or kind of what, what was that like yep I, I was definitely looking for hope mm. I was definitely looking for hope and if I found it it was um you know in out outside at night mm. that's when my kids were asleep that was my moment to be alone and think about it. so yeah. that's kind of the idea I, I was probably writing a song at midnight and, mm. you know it's two in the morning it feels like yesterday it doesn't look any different it feels like it did but it's technically a new day yeah and i started to think maybe that's like like uh, you know, everything is already already changed, but it doesn't feel that way yet. You know, yeah. and I, I think for better and worse, things change before you know it, right? And so yeah. it's almost like the world had changed. The change I wanted was already happening. I didn't feel mm -hmm. that way, right? Yeah. And that was on multiple levels, right? Yeah, and existentially, uh, and the you know the idea that all things will be made but that it didn't feel like things had been made new, but they were in the process that it already, it's like it was, it already, the change was already there. Pre change was already yeah. present. Yeah. Jesus was already present, even though mm -hmm. it didn't know. It didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I really love, yeah. And that, and you've got the lyric in there that the day changes at midnight. Still, you don't know it for another six hours. Yeah. I love that. That sense of like, there is like a limitation to what we can see and mm. sometimes I don't know it's just a process of our perspective being enlarged or our understanding and our imagination of God being enlarged mm -hmm. um him sort of helping to I guess bring light to um situations that we can only sort of see one way but just I, I don't know as a I think I felt this with my album because there was very much this theme of darkness and light running through the album. And actually the course of the day just really helped me to kind of, just even the fact that the sun rises in the morning and that's guaranteed. And then, you know, I sort of followed the course of the day through my album and it just, I don't know, there just was something about the the consistency, the the cycles of, the day, the seasons that just really sort of pointed me to this bigger understanding of, I guess, the faithfulness of God and that he is, he is working in every, in every moment and in every season. So, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, can I ask about the title? Um, Deep Magic? Sure. And um, I mean, where does that come from? Is it, is it got anything to do with C.S. Lewis? Is it, yeah, because I guess magic is probably quite a contested word within, certainly within Christian circles. And maybe yep. I don't know if anyone sort of gave you a hard time about that word. But yeah, sure. just maybe sort of talk about what you mean or what's, yeah, what's the feeling behind deep magic? Yep. So deep magic is technically a C.S. Lewis reference from the Chronicles of Narnia, which okay. I always think it's funny if you, if you quote a dead theologian, then people won't argue. You. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but language is funny. People get really, really messed up about language. Language mm. is language is not a, a science. It's an art. Language is always changing. Mm. And the and meanings change. You take meanings from all over. And and um, you know, even if you look at biblical language and there are uses of words that you could you could take them in multiple different ways, uh, or they 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 originate 
in places that you wouldn't consider the best. Yeah. You know, like yeah. Um, the references to things that most Christians would maybe not be um, super excited to realize where the, the origination of the words came from. Yeah. Um, but I, I I like the idea of deep magic. One is I li- I like to I I like to uh, reimagine things mm-hmm. because what, what often happens is um, it happens with our language as with as with anything else is when you become too familiar with something you um, tend to stop seeing it for what it is mm-hmm. right um, yeah. they, there's there's a phrase that says that familiarity breeds contempt mm. meaning you get too used to something and so i like using new words especially maybe slightly off-putting or might cause people to um want to push back i think that using i knew that the word magic was going to be a little bit um i don't even want to say scan because it's not really i just i just knew that it was going to give people some problems yeah. and i kind of liked that yeah. oddly enough very little pushback. I think part of it is because I quote in a dead theologian, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Quote, <laughs> people won't argue with you, you yeah. know. <laughs> but you know, we use words like enchanted, right? Enchanted. Mm-hmm. You meet a French person, they might say enchanté. And I'm enchanted mm-hmm. to me. That's come from magic words of, you know, but they mean they're actually have a spell cast on them. It's a way of, it's a way of speaking. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea of deep magic is that, um, I, I mean, it works on a number of different levels, and so it means a lot of different things to me. But maybe when I was younger, I was obsessed with like miracles and the the mm-hmm. spectacular element of Christian life. Yeah. But the truth is like. Um, as I've gotten older, I've sort of decided that I don't believe natural and supernatural. It's really only one thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like me talking to you, natural. The fact that we're here at all is natural. We've just decided it's natural because we see it all the time. Mm-hmm. But when you look at our place in the universe, it's actually just absolutely incredible that we exist at all when I'm mm-hmm. even able to have this conversation, yeah. right? Like yeah. there's nothing... There's nothing about that that is less significant than a fish having a gold mouth or a donkey you or a person laying hands on another person and then being healed. Nothing about that is more significant than the fact that you and I exist in the first place. Yeah. And so yeah. often in my charismatic upbringing, we sort of were obsessed with these spectacular moments. Hmm. And um, and it often bred a contempt for uh, for what people call normal life, common life. Mm-hmm. Like like your life once you meet Jesus, all of a sudden your life is spectacular, and that's not true, right? Like I don't think for humans when we meet Jesus, in a lot of ways we just realize that the life we've been living is spectacular on. Yeah. That the breath we've been given, the breath of life we've been given from the yeah. beginning, not common. It it in itself um, is something to be revered, yeah. and and I think I realized that when I was just stuck at home, staring at the walls, and hanging out with my kids and my dog and my wife, and my normal life was all I had. Yeah, you know, and I, I sort of dreamed of going out and doing spectacular things, but the truth is, like miracles were with me the whole time and mm-hmm. that are less significant than anything else that I do yeah. as a, a person. Um, so deep magic in a lot of ways is the magic of every day. Mm. Right. It's finding the magic at home mm. in my life. But when maybe I'm the type of person who wants to find magic in spectacular things outside of my house. I love that. Um, maybe that maybe this is a good moment to introduce the second lyric, which is from the song Deep Magic. And um, it, you say, maybe it's okay to be afraid of getting older, but don't look over your shoulder and say that it, that isn't what it was. And I wonder yeah. if there's something about you sort of looking back on 
you sort of talking about kind of how you used to look for the spectacular. Um, I mean, I might be totally wrong. I do, and I want to just sort of know where that lyric came from. But sure. something about sort of looking at back at how your faith was or your understanding of, of that God and then feeling different in the present. It, I mean, is that what that lyric is getting at? I might I might be totally wrong. I think you're close. It it's that lyric is pointing to the the previous lyric. Um, would you know the miracle if you were in it, or would you resist? Mm -hmm. You know, so don't look back at the miracle that touched your life. It's okay, to miss what you've left behind. It's okay to be afraid of the future, right? Like I'm getting yeah. older. People I know are getting older. People I know are passing away. We've lost friends and family of the past years. You know, we've. Yeah. We've walked through loss, and as you get older, like, there are things in life that go away, mm. right? Your kids grow up, the uh, babies are not there anymore, but your kids are there, and they move out, they go, and they have this life, right? As you get older, like, physically, I can't do the things I used to do. I'm not super old, but in my 40s, my body feels me on a long hike, and it used to. <laughs> Right, like travel, yeah. not what it used to be. Like, yeah, yeah, and 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 also there's the like the music I made when I was younger. Like, mm -hmm. nobody wants, including myself, wants to see trying to be a twenty year old again. Yeah, Just yeah, because but I, but I did it. Right, yeah. I did. I was, I was twenty seven. I yeah. was thirty. I had all those moments. Those moments, I don't. I'm not that, I'm not, that's not who I am anymore, but I had them. Mm -hmm. So maybe I own them. But I look back and say, you know, that's a miracle. Just because I don't have it anymore doesn't mean that it wasn't a miracle mm -hmm. when it happened. It doesn't mean yeah. I have those things with me into the future. And it also doesn't mean that I don't have things to look forward to in the future. Maybe that's part of the pandemic. I um, just turned 40. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, numbers are not a big deal to me. I really don't freak out. Turning forty, some people freak out about turning thirty. Yeah, I really. Do. But I definitely saw things slow down during the pandemic. Mm. I was like, people like the new. They like novel. They want like when you meet your friends, musicians. No one says, "What's your favorite old song you're listening to?" No, they they would say, "What's the thing? What's the new song? What's the new?" Yeah. Yeah. So when you you are the new thing. That's exciting, but you can only be that one. You can be the new thing. And so there's part of me that resented not being the new thing. Yeah. And sitting alone at home, thinking, like when this whole pandemic is over, is anyone going to care about yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. Right. So sort of like, you know, don't look over your shoulder and say it wasn't a miracle. You can complain about it if you want. Yeah. But don't look over your shoulder and say you didn't live this spectacular life. Don't, wow. I keep using spectacular. I need another. I need another word. But don't don't look over your shoulder and say that it wasn't a miracle. Don't look over your shoulder and say that it was. Yeah. Just you don't have it anymore. And there's more in that song about the about the being good too. But that particular line. About, yeah. You know, embracing the past. Even on does yeah. it wasn't. Good here. Yeah. I love that. It's so it's so beautiful. It's like on, there's an honor in that, but also mm -hmm. a humility. Um, yeah. yeah, like not just sort of discounting what was, because it's not, you know, like you're saying, wanting to be that new thing. And thanks for being so honest. I feel like a lot of artists will actually relate to, to what you just said about kind of that almost that pressure to be the new thing or to constantly be making something new. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask if this felt like, did this feel like a brave project to make? Like, did it feel kind of, did it feel like, because it's very honest and I wonder if that process felt like, were you nervous to put it out? Did it, how, how, how did it feel as a project? Um, I really didn't feel nervous. I, I felt Going to do something that I felt like matters. Mm. It's what I was going to do. I hadn't planned on recording it. I just found myself stuck, and I needed something to do, and started writing songs. And then we started putting it out. 
So I didn't know um, that it was going to be an album or if it was going to be a bunch of songs. Yeah. And towards the end, I was like, I feel like these songs are telling a story. We need to go ahead and say that it's going to be an album. Yeah. Right. And so, um, and so we, towards the end, we're like, all right, we, we have a more songs. Let's make it, let's make it an album. Yeah. So I, I didn't feel like it was especially brave. I wasn't especially nervous. I think I was actually surprised at how response when mm-hmm. I put the last couple on on the record, put it out. I was really surprised. It's like, I thought you all heard all these songs, but there's so much music in the world. Yeah. A lot of people hadn't heard the songs we put out as well as the new songs. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah, to me, it just felt like, honestly, of people with dreams, which is the previous, I felt like, but then when I go listen to the two together, they don't sound similar. Mm. So funny, funny. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, I want to I want to ask about the kind of the sound and the production of the album. Sure, sure. Can, I, can I just ask you about one more one more yeah, yeah. which is from the song Roaring Thunder, um, mm-hmm. and that the line from now on everything that happens will happen in the shadow of you. You walked into the room like Roaring Thunder. Can you talk a little bit about this image of Roaring Thunder? Because I feel like you get a lot of this in kind of you know, the, the worship space, the Christian writing space, this image of the power of God. And mm-hmm. I just wonder if there's like another layer to it for you. Um, why is why is it important that, that God was like roaring thunder? Sure. Well, it's a, it's a metaphor that works on multiple levels, mm-hmm. um, which I always like. Um, in one sense, it's about my daughter being born. Mm. Like there are just those moments when because thunder is very loud, very apparent. Mm-hmm. I guess that's kind of the um, kind of the the joke a little bit is that like she was very small thing when she was born. Yeah. Right. Like she was not like in one a powerful presence. She didn't like she didn't come down on a tank or something like that. Yeah. It, it was just a quiet little baby that was born, yeah. but it was like. But she came with a raging presence. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, <laughs> I get a little, I get a little emotional talking about it. But <laughs> you know, she's a very powerful person, mm-hmm. and she so we didn't know we were going to have a girl, or didn't necessarily plan on having her, and she yeah. sort of decided that she, would, uh, yeah, <laughs> come into the picture. Yeah. She was born a little bit early, and she has always done things on her own. Mm. But just thinking back, like, oh, my whole world changed when mm. she was born. Like it was like roaring thunder. Like when you meet someone who changes your life for the first time, they walk into the room. Mm-hmm. Maybe the heavens don't open, mm. right? But they kind of do. Yeah. Right. Practically speaking, like yeah. I will, when you meet someone for the first time who changed your life, you know that your life from then on is different, mm. but it is. Yeah. So it's, it's almost as if uh, the clouds parted and thunder rolled. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, in those moments, because the, because my life is never the same. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea. It, it's that with God too, and God, you know, says the um, the the visible thing speak of the invisible, mm-hmm. and yeah. so the, and that's why it, and all my all my songs are wrapped up in both of those things. It's really not one. Mm-hmm. There's a sort of like normal quote normal things, normal life, normal loves, and all of them speak to the divine, the divine, yeah. divine things. Um, because really, the only, it, the only way to talk about divine things is, is through metaphor. Mm. Almost the only way to talk about divine things is through metaphor. Because because mm-hmm. divine things are so much bigger than we can get our head around. Yeah. So we just have to use words that we have. Yeah. And so biggest things in life, my family and the people of, the, they're the best ways to talk about 
Right. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So meeting my daughter for the first time, kind of like meeting God. Right. You know, the world changes. Yeah. Changes. And the rest of the world doesn't realize, but you definitely know that it's changed. Yeah. Right. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, can I ask if there were any sort of scriptures or sort of biblical themes or parables or anything yeah just kind of in in the writing of the songs and the sculpting of the album like were there any yeah any scriptures that sort of that helped you and sure yeah um no, none that come to mind as far as the exact specific scripture you know in the love with the crown is about the um oh man it's I'm trying to remember where it is. <laughs> there's this, idea, there's this idea, river of God, and I and I sort of I, I started thinking, what if the river of God was people? Because there's this river of people in the world, like you have you have children, and your children have and your children have children, and your children have children, and these ideas and these parts of who you are are handed down. And I started to think, what's the story God is trying to tell generation mm -hmm. of people? Right, because things change, but then they stay the same, and and so I started to picture like, what if the river of God is a river of people? What if it's the generations mm. of people? Um, and I, and then I also started to think about the idea of um, the lion and the lamb laying down together, and what it means the end of violence, and mm. what that means, you know. Um, from the scriptures that, that talk about hmm. new heavens yeah you know um and all those are really big abstract ideas what does it mean now i think more than anything it's a hope right it shows us it gives us something to strive for yeah and for love to wear the crown. what does it mean that god love, right is it the yeah. most powerful force in the world is love and it sounds kind of cheesy but in the better ways love is how the world continues right mm. you can have children without having love but the healthiest children are children who grow up where parents love each other yeah um not that you can't become a healthy child if you love each other but but statistically speaking yeah you know um and, and so when people love each other children and they have families and those children find people to love and they have children what does it mean you know if god is love and love is the way humanity continues and what is this is a river of god yeah what does it all mean i don't know yeah where are we where are we going yeah as as a human you know yeah i i don't know but anyway so i'm thinking about a lot of those things that's probably not your question good. there. Good. <laughs> yeah. And there and scriptures tend to tend to just happen in my church where they just naturally weave the, their way into the songs. But I don't I, off the top of my head, I think of any specifics. No, that's cool. Um I wanted to just ask just a couple more questions if it's sure. if it's okay. Um about kind of specific like your song craft and your lyrics, which kind of I was just saying at the beginning, just your use of imagery and metaphor and like lyrics that sort of like make you do a double take and because you haven't heard like the specific image that you've painted before. Like there's so much unexpected treasure, I feel like lying in your lyrics. And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, is that something that's always naturally come to you? Like, have you intentionally worked on, on that? Like, I'm specifically talking about lyrics. Um, just wondering how maybe if there's like songwriters watching, um, any like pro tips. <laughs> well, I didn't grow up in a very musical house, so okay. I really didn't start playing or writing songs till my late teens or even early. Yeah, probably really didn't really write my first songs until I was in my twenties, and so I wasn't naturally a very good singer or naturally a very good so I think subconsciously I sort of decided that I need to write good lyrics because I don't know that 
you know, that my voice or my chord changes or my melodies are going to be. Interesting. So I think early on, I really dug into lyric writing. And I don't know why the metaphor thing became so prevalent. I, I, at the time, I just felt like it was a good way to write a song. Mm-hmm. It's just the way my songs ended up happening. Um, maybe some of it was growing up in the 90s, and the 90s were so weird as far as lyrics, as far as you had songs on the radio that really didn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> not like they really didn't. Yeah. You know. 90s tend to very absurd and absurd absurd lyrics were really interesting. Yeah. In the 90s, I don't know if it had something like that, just the music I was listening to. But most of the time, I didn't know what my favorite artists were even talking about. And I'm not sure they did either. Yeah. But I was always attracted to the words they used, yeah. to the image they created. And so I wonder if some of that has to do with that. I, I think sometimes, as I don't know what I'm saying, not that I, it's not that I don't know. I, I have an idea that I'm feeling and I don't know what it means and I'm I'm trying to get there. Mm. And I think I wonder if the the metaphor is me trying to figure out what it is, where it is that I'm trying to go, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, sort of a a tool for saying something I don't know how to say, I guess. Yeah. I think I may have frozen. Am I am I frozen for you? I I just see a black screen where you were, but I hear you though. Oh no. Um technology. Oh gosh. <laughs> One sec. Black black screen for you? Yep. Well, um wonder. Before, which, sure. which is about production and ironically sound <laughs> and um, yeah maybe just I'd love to know a bit about kind of how you approached you know finding the sound to serve these songs you know how how did you approach the production um, yeah yep well um, partly because it was during the pandemic people weren't traveling and um, I had a just a, a good friend of mine who I did the People with Truth album. We would just start getting together and stuff, the two of us. Um, and I don't know that we really had an end in mind as much as we just tried to keep ourselves interested. Um, I ended up writing some songs on the piano that I hadn't done much of. Um, and then we, we ended up using some more acoustic guitar. But I don't know that we really had a plan as much as we wanted to not be bored. Yeah. So I will say we 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 tried not to over track. I've done a lot of that in the past. We track a ton of stuff and you gotta figure out what you have to cut out. Mm. We definitely tried and some of the songs are still a lot going on. Um but um but for the most part we tried we, we tried to keep things more minimal than we had in the past. Yeah. Um just because we started to feel like all the different little things started to bite one another, especially the way people listen to music now. Mm. They don't often listen on like big, nice speakers uh, the way they do. So a lot of times listening on inferior devices. Yeah. So you need a little bit simpler arrangement sometimes. Uh, yeah. So we, we, we kind of, I think some of my other albums, I didn't like the way it sounded on by yeah. itself. So on this last one, I was like, I really want it to sound good on, like, just from my speaker. Yeah. 
and and so we decided that less was more as far as that was concerned. So there wasn't a lot of intention. It's more just like what's fun. What have we not done before? What serves the song? That's brilliant. Well, thanks. I wish I had better. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for you. No, no. I actually, I think that's it's like a genius move because it's it's that moment when you're in the mastering, you know, in the mastering engineer's room and they're like you know, 6,000 pound speakers and like, you know, it just, everything sounds unbelievable. And you have this realization, like this is the best it's ever going to sound because the reality <laughs> is like most people are going to listen to it out of laptop speakers or yeah. out of their phone. So actually I think it's such a smart move to be even thinking about that in the production that, you know, what does this sound playing out of a, a tinny Bluetooth speaker, which has loads of high end, <laughs> you know, like does the song still cut through? So I actually love, I love that answer. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Um, I, I've got one final question. I'm so annoyed sure. about technology and I'm sorry that this is not a pro <laughs> interview because you are, you deserve a pro interview, John Mark, and I'm sorry I couldn't deliver it. Um, but can, can you share a little bit about the, um, the new album you're making is it sure. sort of under wraps or is there anything you can share yeah yeah i um i found myself so we we put these songs out and we we toured for a couple of years um and at the end of the last tour i mean like uh, i was really glad we were able to go out and do what we had done before you know it's during the pandemic we were still then we you couldn't really book show until the venues were actually open. Then we just started booking, we had to book a year out. So we were like, we didn't tour for two years in some places in the country we didn't visit for three. And I haven't been to the UK in probably five, five yeah. years. But so I know, definitely. Yeah. So we had done um, a, a US tour. We toured most of the country. And the, last, the last leg was a lot of fun, but also we were feeling really beat up. Uh, just physically, part of it was uh, we booked a tour that really was booked for a tour bus, meaning like you travel at night and you sleep on the bus, um, and all the buses were gone. We couldn't get a bus, so we ended up getting another vehicle, but we weren't able to scale down any of the shows. So we literally load out of the venue like one in the morning and get on the vehicle, and some nights we would drive and to load in the next day. Wow. Not and a lot of us sleep. My back went out. I got sick. Lost my voice. And oh gosh, yeah. Think, uh, when I was when I was twenty five, this was so much fun. Um, yeah. But physically, I could handle it at twenty five. I was a lot tougher at twenty five. Um, and uh, but at forty four, uh, <laughs> like uh, you know, like it's hard to hard to do it. Um, I started to think, I was like, do I need a change? Is it time for a change? And um, I went through a season where I was like, what if it is time for a change? What does that mean? Mm. You know, like, I love what I do. I don't plan on stopping, but maybe I'm supposed to focus on something else. And during that time, I started writing worship songs. Mm. And philosophically, everything I write comes from a place of worship, from a worshipful place. Yeah. But I found myself in songs, like simple praise choruses. Yeah. Most me, right? Mostly just to sing. And I think that um, there are things I needed to say that I could I couldn't say unless I wrote. Mm. And I started writing these. Now, why am I doing this? What What's happening? I'm really leading worship at a church anywhere. Yeah. I, in a lot of ways, I left mainstream worship behind. I just felt like falling, which is funny because a lot of people know me because of the big worship songs I wrote years back, but yeah. perfectly kind of walked away from that world a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's funny how out of the blue, I started writing all these songs. And so I, I called a friend of mine, like, maybe we should record these. Yeah. Um, I got really excited about it. I'm, I'm calling it my uncool worship. Like a lot of the songs are like could have been written in the 70s, 80s, right? Yeah, they're the yeah. most uncool 
cool songs. There's nothing about them that is like overly spectacular. They're I just, love that. I love they're just that. good. And they just, they just felt good. They didn't feel like I'm not trying to, not looking for any explosions or any fireworks. Yes. Just songs you can sing all day. Yeah. And live with. And um, I don't, I don't criticize worship music a lot. Like I don't feel like my job yeah. or that right. Like I, I think people who criticize music are very interesting people. Yeah. <laughs> music is not, you can say, you know, one plus one does not three. Mm. And you can say two plus two, four, but you can't call a song a good song or a bad song. I don't care who you are. You don't really get to do that. Yeah. Right. The song, there are no good and bad songs. They're just songs that mean things to some people and don't mean to other people. Yeah. So all that said, like I, but I think I, I have had a hard time in the, mm-hmm. in the last few years finding worship music that I felt could live with me. Yeah. Um, there is, but there is a lot. There, 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 there is out there that I definitely love. Um, and there's stuff that's worshipful. And there's people like um, John Mark Pantan. People like really beautiful songs um, that I can live with, but like, but on a large scale, there's there's not a. I sound really mean saying that. There's not a lot. I hear you. I hear you. There's not a lot of music out there that speaks to me. Yeah. Oh, I think I started writing. I love that. A lot of the worship music is written like explode on Sunday morning, and a lot of worship music is written to be played in a stadium. But worship is not generally. Yeah. Happen in, it happens in your oh. life, it happens in small rooms, it happens in your car, it happens in the little churches and mm. school rooms, at work and behind your desk. So I needed songs that I could sing and during the so I wrote a bunch of them and then so anyway we decided to record them. Love that. Now the production may not feel like the songs do. This, <laughs> we ended up finding a few explosions. I told the band no explosions. <laughs> no, no big builds, none of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we get in there, and like a few of those still happen anyway. But yeah, because maybe they wanted to. But that was kind of the. Idea. I I'm really excited about what it means. Like, well, like playing clubs and doing the rock and roll thing that I do. Maybe. Um, and I I don't know where my place is. It's the larger church, mm. you know. I go to church. I've I've never stopped going to church. I go to a small church in town. Yeah. And I don't, um, and so I, I don't know what the world is like outside of my yeah. tour clubs and then just my church. We'll see if the church at large wants these songs or not. But if they don't, it's still going to be something I love. I love that. I wish I wish you could see my screen and my face sort of manically nodding along to everything you're saying because <laughs> I, it's so interesting. I feel exactly in the same place, and the songs are kind of. I'm. I mean, I'm not at the stage of being ready for the next project, but I, I really feel like the next project for me is just simple songs to Jesus. Like, what are just the everyday prayers that you pray to the Lord? Like, kind of like you're saying that not not particularly spectacular or explosive songs, but just those honest, simple refrains. And I completely agree. Like you know, the 90%, I mean, I'm making this number up, but the majority of church is, you know, people in a living room or people in a small church and Marjorie playing the flute and Brian playing, you know, a guitar and they know three chords. And it's like, that is the reality of the majority of worship and just like the faithful yeah. of people continuing yeah. to meet in small spaces. I just think that that kind of, that space in church needs needs songs that are simple and easy to grasp onto and just just feel human hu- human yep. scale songs yep um, so i'm i am super excited to hear these songs that you're that are recorded now do you know well, do you know when the album will be out uh so I, my goal was to have the album out this fall okay nice uh but i i'm a little bit like uh, here in the U.S., the election is happening, and it, it becomes a very, very ugly season where nobody has any, nobody yeah. has, and talk about anything outside of politics. So I'm, 
I'm considering holding off until 25. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, maybe I'll put some singles. In. I don't want to. I don't want to compete with the uh, ugly election boys. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I feel like it's an important record for me. Yeah. And I don't want to put it out and, you know, get squashed by all the vehement argument yeah. and screaming yeah. that happened. It's not this. It's not the right soil for these songs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I hear that. John Mark, it's honestly been such a pleasure to speak to you. I'm once again, and to everyone who's sort of joined, um, thank you for joining. Um, and I'm sorry that I'm just a dis disembodied black square. Um, <laughs> but it's been such a joy to speak to you and just to hear more about the process and just the well that is in you um, for just your imagination of God and of life and of faith. And yeah, it's just been such a pleasure to hear more about your, your story. So thank well, you. Yeah. And yeah, from the UK. <laughs> yes. I, I need to back. I yeah. love the, it's been way too long. Yeah. All right. Well, have a lovely afternoon and yeah. Um, yeah, bless you. Thank you so much. All right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right, bye.